Our guest this morning is Sean Bonnet, founder and CEO of Precision Group, one of the nation's most innovative and pioneering private investment and development organisations. Precision Group has an extensive property portfolio and development pipeline with interests across the retail, commercial office and hospitality sectors. Precision Group has a major financial interest in Prezi, the leading e-gift card provider that has a significant customer base both nationally and increasingly internationally. Additionally, the group is a major shareholder of SkyFi, an Australian software technology company providing analytics and data-driven marketing products. SkyFi is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange with an international presence in the UK, North America, South America and South Africa. Sean is also a non-executive director of iSelect, an ASX-listed consumer comparison service, managing director of Lenders Direct, a private equity finance company, and the chairman and non-executive director of Litigation Lending Services, a litigation funding solutions provider. He also holds a number of key positions within the arts and philanthropic sectors, including as co-founder of Heartfelt Foundation, a President's Council member of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and Deputy Chairman of Life Education Australia. Sean is also a qualified barrister and solicitor of the High Court of Australia. Sean, it's a pleasure having you on the program this morning. Thanks for your time. Let's begin with your perspective on the current environment. What is your reading on the strength of the Australian economy at the moment? Thank you for having me, Rob. Um, look, I, I think we're living in a blessed country. It's uh, been 12 months of a lot of uncertainty uh, all over the world but we're one of the very few countries which has managed to start coming out of this in a truly leading way. I think um, we're, still, we're still not there yet and it will be continued uncertainty um, and a bumpy ride for some time, uh, but we're, we're doing very well. Now, you're the owner of a significant portfolio of shopping centre assets, including the Chevron Renaissance Complex in Queensland, Port Adelaide Plaza in South Australia and Paran Central in Victoria. How are you finding both occupancy rates and the level of leasing activity across those centres? Well, when, when the pandemic first came, we, um, we spent a lot of time thinking of how we would operate. And we came up with the perspective that rather than be reassessing things on a week to week or month to month basis, that we would take a 12 month outlook and really preserve our assets and our tenants uh, as best as we could, ensuring uh, that we didn't um, have any staff terminations, uh, we didn't cut, cut remuneration. Uh, we really tried to instill as much hope and confidence that uh, we, would, we would come out of this. Precision Group is also the owner of significant commercial assets, including a 22-level office building at 144 Edward Street in Brisbane CBD. Take us through the vacancy rate for that particular asset, if you could, and how long do you think it'll take to rebound to pre-COVID-19 levels? Look, uh, with our office assets, um, again, we're probably fortunate to have them in sort of Brisbane, Adelaide and North Sydney, uh, which have probably been um, areas which have been least impacted by the pandemic. So our occupancy rates during the last 12 months have um, amazingly risen. Um, having said that, uh, our occupancy costs are significantly less than Sydney uh, and Melbourne CBDs. And uh, I guess with a, with a greater um, flexibility of tenants, uh, work, home uh, policies, I think our assets have actually thrived. 
Over the course of the past 12 months, we've seen mixed responses by state and federal governments to the pandemic, particularly around borders. I want to ask, how would you evaluate the performance of governments during this time and does there need to be a nationally consistent approach right across the board? Yeah, look, I mean, there was no um, handbook for handling the pandemic, whether for uh, business or for government. So I think uh, it's important not to be too critical uh, of either. And I think the Australian government has done a commendable job um, on all levels. Um, it, it's actually quite, I think, extraordinary the way Australia has really um, shown what it's made of and kept absolutely vigilant um, during the last 12 months. Um, from a government perspective, I think one of the more challenging issues has been the way um, the states have operated independently and clearly um, the establishment of the processes and QR codes uh, has been really important. I, I think what, what's needed is really to be adopting a national approach. And I think I'm very proud uh, as having uh, seen the way New South Wales operates and obviously living in Sydney to say that I think if, if the New South Wales model is adopted nationally, uh, that um, hopefully the short-term lockdowns will be very much a, a thing of the past. What impact have the events had of 2020 on the broader retail industry and to what extent will these events impact consumer behaviour in the future? Well, I think um, the impact's been cataclysmic. It's uh, required retailers really to strip down their thinking back to absolute um, base approach of really having to work through what their models should actually be. And uh, in some ways that's been uh, an incredible uh, fast tracking retailers business planning and in other instances it's been absolutely devastating. It's it's the old Darwin's theory. If you can adapt quick enough, uh, you will survive and thrive. Um, I think from a retailer's point of view, uh, the fast track of online has forced them to really come up with the fusion of their physical businesses with their online platforms. And that has created and I think will create in the coming year a number of hybrid models. Let's talk about Sean Bonnet, the person. I read that growing up your mother was your inspiration. Take me through your earliest childhood memories and how it shaped the person that you are today. My mother was an in incredible inspiration as well as my dad. Um, focus on, on with my father being a medical specialist, caring for people, uh, and my mother, who was um, very much into uh, relationship building and um, treating people equally, uh, no matter who they were, um, that, that, that left a, a profound impact on me to it's always just the old adage of treating people like you want, want to be treated. In 1978, you moved to Australia with your family. What were your first impressions of this new country? I think the space and um, liberties that we, we enjoy in Australia, I remember um, feeling quite wondrous about having been born in um, London 
and then spending uh, some time in Malta. Uh, coming to to Australia was was uh, really a new sense of freedom. The parks, the um, different cuisines, um, the beaches. Uh, it, it really was, was the lucky country. And following high school at St Ignatius College, you enrolled in a Bachelor of Art, Bachelor of Law degree at the University of Adelaide before also completing a graduate diploma in legal practice. What were you like as a student and what attracted you to the legal profession initially? Well, I think I had about half a dozen different professions I was interested in. Um, my father used to tell me that I couldn't become a doctor. Um, I think really because it, it, um, it completely consumed him. He was um, always on call and um, while he loved what he did, uh, he, he thought it was a, uh, a real, you needed to have a, a special calling for it. Um, I think what attracted me about the, the legal profession was, was really just understanding uh, the way the law operated. It's, it's a framework for how people interact. Um, it really sets the minimum standards. Before we delve into Precision Group, I'm interested to know where your interest in property originated from. It doesn't sound like there was a family involvement within the property industry. So where did you get your start, or at least what motivated you to get into property? I think I started out um, working as a lawyer and enjoying um, initially seeing uh, uh, companies growing and building uh, in all sorts of ways, acquisitions and um, development. Uh, the um, 90s were an exciting time initially. And uh, however, within a couple of years, the storm clouds came and uh, really just seeing the absolute polarity of that. Uh, companies being put into administration, uh, people's assets being taken from them. Um, it, it was you know, a really dark time. And it, um, it certainly, within a relatively short time, I worked out that it wasn't for me. Um, having a passion for uh, being involved in um, growing and developing um, more positive pursuits. Speaking of, you founded Precision Group in the 90s, in 1994 to be exact, as a small investment and redevelopment property business with a mandate focused on finding distressed asset opportunities that had turnaround potential. Walk us through some of the deals you completed early on during this period in terms of what sector were they in, what size of assets and, and whereabouts were they located? So we, we were living in Adelaide and um, South Australia uh, in the mid-90s had been very heavily hit, arguably the worst state uh, in terms of uh, the impact the recession was, was having in Australia. If you remember, even the State Bank of South Australia had, had gone into receivership and many key projects which it was funding actually came to a, an absolute halt. Um, the earlier opportunities were really focused on finding distressed assets, ugly ducklings, and um, really creating finance structures in order to acquire them. I mean, quite uh, different to today, uh, interest rates at that time uh, were in the high teens. In fact, I remember, uh, you know, negotiating first mortgage rates at 
10 and 12 percent. And second mortgage rates, I'd prefer, probably prefer not to, not to mention or remember. Um, but save as to say, you could also buy assets at 16, 17, 18 percent yields. Uh, so you still could actually make a margin. And it was really that, that opportunity which, which gave Precision its, its, uh, its first start with finding smaller distressed, um, distressed retail sites, um, finding the um, margin where we could actually make a little from it and uh, putting together a dedicated team who, who improved those assets. And within a, a short time, we started to create a, uh, an equity base for us. So then in 1998, four years later, Precision Group completed its first major acquisition with the purchase of what was then known as the Port Canal Shopping Centre. How did this acquisition come about and how have you gone about repositioning that asset in, in more recent times? So, not that dissimilar to the earlier ones, just on a larger scale, uh, the Port Canal Shopping centre was, uh, was very much of an ugly duckling. Um, at that time, owned by Babcock and Brown in, um, in Sydney. And they had been trying to sell it for, uh, for six plus months. And not surprisingly, uh, being in South Australia as well, uh, they couldn't find any takers. Um, it looked to me like an opportunity that once they will, were not able to sell it in the marketplace to really um, ha have a go and, and seeing if Precision could acquire it. And uh, I had come up to meet at that time, uh, it was Phil Green, uh, who was the CEO of Babcock and Brown, uh, an absolute gentleman to deal with. Uh, he obviously wanted to sell the asset. Um, and, you know, not only did he end up selling the asset uh, to Precision, uh, but he also assisted with um, ensuring we financed it as well, uh, taking over finance structures that they had in place and also providing some structured finance as well. So really it enabled uh, at that time a uh, relatively small player in the market suddenly buying an asset of sort of 36 plus million dollars, uh, which was really taking the company up two or three rungs uh, within a few years. And then in 2005, you purchased the Paran Central Complex on Chapel Street from Lang Walker for circa $34.5 million. Take me through the opportunity and, and the impetus for this particular transaction. Uh, Pran was really uh, providing uh, precision at that time an entry into the Melbourne market. Uh, again, a uh, um, uh, retail centre uh, in a very concentrated residential hub. Uh, I think Pran is now technically part of the uh, uh, city of Melbourne, although at the time of acquisition it wasn't. Um, it's certainly the highest density uh, residential suburb in Melbourne, um, surrounded by uh, two highly performing supermarkets, and of course the iconic Pran markets. It provided Precision a, a very visible retail opportunity in order to uh, have a more intensive asset management of the asset and uh, improve uh, what uh, Lang had already done a, a terrific job of. 
More recently, you acquired the Chevron Renaissance Shopping Centre on the Gold Coast in 2015 from Morgan Stanley for circa $74 million. The Gold Coast is going through a significant transformation currently. How are you finding occupancy and turnover since the acquisition of that asset? I think the timing of acquisition of that asset was we, we were very lucky. Um, Chevron was very much uh, for many years, for many almost decades, uh, the centre of the Gold Coast uh, retail ac activity. And um, again, having uh, become uh, somewhat distressed, I saw the asset, asset as a terrific opportunity for, for uh, Precision to um, really try to restore it back to its uh, former glories. Uh, being very services based with uh, the largest supermarket, Coles, uh, in, in the Gold Coast precinct and uh, its emphasis on uh, cafes and restaurants. It, it really was, um, uh, I think, a, a really effective opportunity for us to uh, inject uh, funds and uh, really focus on creating a much greater level of experience for the customers. And we're now in 2021, where are you finding the best opportunities in the current market with relation to whether your shopping centre or your commercial office assets? Again, I don't think it's any secret. Um, I think we were very fortunate to have almost 80% uh, of our assets in Queensland and South Australia and New Zealand. Um, obviously, a lot less impacted by the pandemic. Um, so I think probably one of the greatest opportunities Precision has now is really to continue to adapt our centres to the new customer needs, the focus on the experience, the focus on feeling safe when you shop, uh, the greater uh, need for, for time efficiencies. Uh, big is no longer beautiful. Uh, the customer wants to really get in and out uh, in, a, in a much shorter period of time, there's a lot less dwell time. When you are acquiring or looking to acquire new assets, what sort of process do you go through and what sort of fundamentals do you consider during that period? I think with everything, not just real estate, um, being an entrepreneur at heart, I have quite a, I think, a reasonable instinct for whether we should pursue looking at an opportunity. Uh, but, you know, once you identify an opportunity, it's all about the research. Uh, there's no substitute. Uh, finding out uh, as much about uh, what you're going to acquire, um, and it's the old rule that sometimes what you think might be completely uh, uh, small and irrelevant ends up um, providing you the biggest uh, insights. Let's now discuss the retail sector. In your view, what do retail businesses need to be doing both to survive the current uncertainty and then to thrive in what's an ever-changing retail landscape? As I've said um, over the last couple of years, uh, I think retailers um, are living in a physical world, physical and online, and it's all about bringing those two parts of their business together. So what a, a number of retailers uh, which have uh, reacted quickly uh, seem to me to be doing, from what I've observed, 
is really rethinking their logistical systems. Uh, I think uh, almost all have too many retail stores. Uh, and they also have warehouses, which are usually separated from their retail stores. So what I'm seeing is a number of those retailers looking, yes, they, they may be looking to have less retail stores, but they're looking now to potentially have, have larger shops with warehousing at the back of those shops where those shops become um, their digital online supplier and also supply the store. How do you approach your relationships with tenants? I mean, what do you look for in a relationship with your tenants and what do you think that you can offer them that makes Precision Group an attractive landlord? Well, I think, um, again, it's, it's really about um, taking a long-term perspective. It's one of the key differentiating factors of precision. I think being a private business, we've enjoyed the luxury of being able to take long-term approaches with not only our assets, but our relationships. And taking the time to really understand our retailer to really understand um, what they're trying to achieve and working with them in a very collaborative way um, in terms of it's not just filling a vacancy, it's really working out where should that business best be in the shopping centre, you know, what are their best adjacencies, uh, working out the best timing for opening, working with our marketing uh, team in terms of how we can be supporting them um, with various pro promotions, um, giving them our own observations, being one step removed from their business, uh, giving, giving them candid and transparent observations of what they're doing right, but also what they're not. Uh, really it's all about having deeply honest relationships. You were vocal last year in response to major retailers looking to shift from a fixed rental amount to a percentage of gross sales amount. Take me through why the current system remains the most efficient and effective for both parties. Yeah, look, you know, where, when there are crisis times, unfortunately, there are parties who can look at those times as opportunities to be exploitive and um, you know, at that time the government made uh, it very clear with their code of conduct that the focus needed to be on uh, landlords providing assistance to small retailers and Precision adopted that, that approach. Um, with respect to ultimately medium or larger retailers potentially trying to shift uh, to a more turnover based uh, rental model. Um, look, the short answer is um, I don't know any banks that would lend uh, money based upon whether their customer was successful or not. And, uh, you know, the Australian real estate market, which um, underpins um, the majority of Australia's superannuation industry, is based upon fixed term rentals, uh, which then support valuations, uh, which then support lending. Uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, a model that's been in place for uh, many, many decades and it's enabled Australia to be one of the leading countries uh, of the world. You mentioned in an article last year that COVID is a game changer for retail opening up and I quote, new usages and categories. 
Take me through how you see your centres changing in the future from a tenancy mix perspective. Like um, I mentioned previously, um, customer needs have changed. There's a much greater focus with time efficiency to bring the customer inside the centre uh, as efficiently as possible, appreciating they may not wish to to dwell for extended periods. Um, there's knowing that the customer is likely to have done their research before coming into, into the centre if they're going to make any material purchase. There's the experience. The um, fact that the customer wants to actually enjoy the shop actually have as pleasurable a, a shop as possible. You know, all, all these factors are the responsibility of the centre and the retailer to different extents. Um, and, and this is where I think centres and retailers need to work closer with each other uh, more than ever before. Um, certainly from a um, customer perspective, the focus on, on uh, quality food products, on services, on um, really entertainment has never, never been so high and is, I think, in my view, only likely to increase. So centres really need to uh, appreciate that the bar has been risen and if we are going to um, draw the customer away from their, their computers, uh, you need to provide them something different. And that is where I think uh, the opportunity lies. Um, in some ways, uh, bricks and mortar have never been, uh, can uh, be confident that they're here to stay, but it's really in creating that whole customer experience with the retailer, uh, that, that's, that's where the future lies. Now, some estimates out of the US have around one in five malls closing over the next one to three years. I want to ask, what are the fundamentals involved in operating a successful shopping centre or successful shopping centre portfolio? Um, I, I actually thought it was higher than that. Um, and, and there's no doubt in Australia as well, um, I'm sure there will be malls that close. Uh, I think... Uh, over the last a couple of decades, uh, the um, amount of choice that has um, resulted with shopping centres, with retail categories, uh, it confuses the customer. At the end of the day, does the customer want to have three or four pharmacies in a shopping centre to choose from? No, it wants to have the best pharmacy which will produce the full range of products at reasonable prices. Um, so I think there, therein lies how things are changing in, in terms of the customer is not looking for duplication or quadruplication. It's looking really to have uh, an efficient tenancy mix where they can enter your centre, get whatever products and services they're out for, have a good time in doing it, uh, and hopefully not, not take too long. T time is the most important currency. Outside of property, you're involved in a number of businesses, including Prezi, which I mentioned earlier. Prezi is a leading e-gift card provider. As I understand it, the business has experienced enormous growth, particularly in Australia, the US and the UK, amongst other markets. Take me through how your involvement in the business came about. Yeah, look, over the last 
15 years, I enabled, had a I guess, vision for Precision to get involved uh, in, in other, what I thought were related businesses. Uh, at the time, I, I don't think many people necessarily agreed. Um, and approximately five years ago, uh, I had met two, uh, the two initial founders of, of Prezi, uh, Claire Morris and Matt Hoggett, uh, had come and seen me, in fact, in, in this boardroom, and um, had told me about their idea, and um, showed me a few wireframes of how things would work, and um, I thought it was, it was right on the money. It was something that I had actually been envisaging, having a gift card which is interchangeable, which enabled choice, giving the consumer the ability to choose whatever other gift card they wanted, or in Prezi's case, a, a number. Um, and we, we had um, developed the app using a, a very expensive Silicon Valley uh, app developer, and Prezi was born. What are the main benefits of using Prezi, and how has Precision Group as a business assisted with the growth of Prezi over the past five or six years that it's been involved? So, look, Prezi has probably its two key differentiating um, advantages are the interchangeability of a gift card. You don't have to think, what shall I give Rob today? Uh, JB Hi-Fi card? No, you give him a Prezi and he can choose over 400 cards. Um, and from a transaction point of view, it's state-of-the-art technology. So transactions usually take somewhere around two seconds where our competitors uh, take about eight or nine. Precision Group is also a major shareholder of SkyFi, the world's most trusted omni-data intelligence company. What does this business do in, in practical terms? SkyFi is a data analytics business, um, which uh, a lot of people look at as code for sort of the Wizard of Oz. Um, it, it really, um, through um, various means, uh, obtains data uh, when a customer is inside a shopping centre or approaching a shopping centre or in public places in a completely legal and anonymised way and really provides that data to the centre and retailers uh, in order to make uh, insights into how uh, the centre or retailers can service their customer uh, in a more personalised way. You're also heavily involved in philanthropic causes as well with reference to the Heartfelt Foundation and also Life Education Australia. Take me through both of your interests in, in these non-for-profits and, and how important is being involved in philanthropy in general to you? Um, look, coming from a family where my dad was um, really in a charitable profession, he, he was a doctor and really uh, cared for people 100% of the time. Uh, I think he thought probably 110% of the time. Um, being involved in making um, a contribution to the community um, is really important. And being in a, a commercial enterprise, in my view, even more important. I think it's, it's, it's really the, the social license that I think is, is really emerging uh, in corporate Australia, but I think in, 
in every, in every uh, country around the world uh, to actually make, whether it be a small or a large contribution, just some contribution, some meaningful contribution uh, to the communities that you operate in. Uh, for me, um, that was in starting uh, our own family charity, the Heartfelt Foundation, uh, which focuses really under uh, assisting uh, people and charities under stress, um, not the ones that you, you uh, commonly see, but the ones under the radar. And, uh, you know, life education, um, which really, I'm sure you've seen Healthy Herald, um, really focusing on providing uh, our sort of young people with that sort of education, uh, which they don't necessarily get in the classrooms. Uh, whether that is with respect to how to uh, treat themselves kindly, you know, what being healthy actually means, um, you know, sex education, um, and, and, you know, even giving them some, or at least the beginnings of teaching of perhaps uh, using their money in a measured and responsible way. And um, the Prince's Trust, uh, which is His Royal Highness's charity, uh, Prince Charles, which uh, I'm honoured to, to uh, be on the board of, uh, and which amongst um, a number of things uh, really provides young people a second chance uh, who may not have had at the best start in life. Uh, it, it's, it's actually um, the largest uh, charitable organisation uh, in the UK uh, and uh, it's, uh, it does amazing work uh, really uh, even with um, young people who've, who've been to jail um, that, that three months uh, when they come out is uh, fundamentally important uh, for them to be provided support, and uh, the Prince's Trust is there. Um, it's, it's also uh, active with respect to uh, veteran care, um, which, it, um, which, it, which it makes a, a strong contribution in. Now, a couple of quick questions to finish. You've been very generous with your time. So I want to start with motivation. What, what keeps you coming to work every day? It's, I don't see it as work. I, I think uh, after 26 odd years, um, it, it's, it's really something which I'm incredibly passionate uh, for it's really part of, of the way I enjoy my life. I feel um, absolutely privileged to work with a great team of people and uh, to be involved in some uh, really interesting businesses and hopefully uh, most of the time uh, make a meaningful contribution as well. What are the best pieces of advice that you can pass on? Look, I think from the beginning, uh, Precisions and myself have focused on having a commitment to excellence, uh, to always do things well. Um, if necessary, to take, take more time to ensure we get it right. Um, it's amazing, you know, when, when, when people rush things or cut corners, invariably they're always going to have to go back and fix it up and you, it's, you regret doing that. Um, and if there's anything that I've learned over this time is it's that commitment to excellence that has 
ensured that we are in the sound and strong position we are in today. What's next for Precision Group and how excited are you by the new Port Adelaide Plaza complex which has undergone a significant transformation and renovation over the, the past couple of years? Port Adelaide was Precision's uh, first um, major acquisition. Um, so really 22 years later, going back and being able to completely redevelop it um, into a contemporary uh, shopping centre and uh, really uh, return uh, some of the goodwill that that community uh, enabled us uh, to have uh, over, over this period and hopefully providing them a, a leading shopping centre has been uh, yeah, immensely uh, satisfying. My final question is how would you evaluate the future economic outlook of Australia? Look Rob, I, I don't think we can take anything for granted uh, and I think we need to always be taking a cautious and restrained approach, uh, but we should also um, take comfort that Australia is one of the few leading countries uh, at this time and that we can, uh, we can be quietly confident that uh, short of some uh, some disastrous event uh, that the next 12 to 24 months uh, look incredibly promising for Australia. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure having a chat with you this morning. Thanks for being so generous with your time and so good to see somebody with such social success, business success and entrepreneurial success on the program. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you.